before um, before we get to the to the main event on tonight, the lecture of Itoshi Abe, I just wanted to take a minute uh, to remind everybody to celebrate for just a brief uh, Jose Aubry career, who died recently. He was a great architect, uh, the last living disciple of Le Corbusier. He did remarkable work as a teacher, as an, uh, as an architect. And we were lucky enough to have an exhibition of his work a few years ago. So anyway, I just, and I know he meant a lot for many people um, in our faculty. So I just wanted to uh, at least pay this small little homage to him. Um, anyway, he will be missed, but he have a fantastic life that need to be celebrated more than anything else. And that's it. Now, let's get to tonight. Uh, I want to welcome everybody. I hope that we got architecture in Japanese right. Uh, a lot of effort was to double check that. We were looking around to find uh, a Japanese member and a student group of faculty to help us with. Um, so we got checked out. Itoshi Abe, um, um, in a strange way, I think there is a connection between uh, Jose and, and, and Itoshi in the sense that they're both absolutely committed and passionate about architecture. Itoshi is also an alum of the house. Um, I was I was thinking to put March '89 or not. I didn't I didn't want to give away your age. Um, so, but he was very 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 young when he graduated. He, he was a stellar. Um, so, and I, I I've been thinking a lot about how to introduce Hitoshi. Um, first, uh, before I keep going with that, I want to welcome the massive contingent group of people from UCLA that made it all the way from the west side to this coast. Um, uh, it's a remarkable thing. You should all get a bus and get a group discount or something. Um, but it, it's fantastic. It, it's a good sign of the respect of, of that Hitoshi commands with his peers. So it, it's fantastic that we have him here. So formally, this uh, Hitoshi right now uh, is a professor and former chair in the Department of Architecture and Urban Design at UCLA and the director of the UCLA, Paul and Isako Teresaki Center for Japanese Studies. But what I wanted, what I was trying to figure it out how to speak about the work of Hitoshi is um, there are many ways that this can be addressed. But the one I keep thinking and I keep going back is to talk a little bit about the distinction between a style and identity. And I think any, any, there are many forms to be an architect and many ways to be an architect. Uh, and some, some architects commit to the notion of a style. And I think this is very valid, even though we tend not to discuss in those terms in the schools, um, but many people, even they don't admit, they are obsessed with that, they're still signature. And there is the notion of identity. And in many ways, in the context of architecture, art of any creative field, um, this could be closely related, but they're not necessarily mean the same. Um, so a style is more about characteristics or manners or modal expressions that distinguish the work of an individual or a group, uh, a particular period in campus, we know the modernist style, the postmodernism, uh, neoclassicism, and so on, and they have features and principles. Identity, on the other hand, is more deeply rooted in the essence of a core of an individual, group of entity. It goes beyond mere aesthetics and reflects the fundamental values, belief, culture, and context that shape, that shape that creation. In architecture, identity can be expressed through the use of cultural motif, local materials, or the integration of cultural traditions that gives a sense of belonging in the, when you build something. So a style might change over time. Identity tends to be more enduring. And I really think Itoshi's work is more in the identity than anything else. Not because the work jumps from many ways, but the work is not necessarily repetitive on any level. There is each of them take a different character, but at the same time, it respects that identity because ultimately, I think Hitoshi is a cultural practitioner, which I think is what any great architect should aspire to. So I think this notion of identity is a fascinating one, and I think his work represents that, and I think it's a different take how to deal with that and how to navigate when you operate across cultures and when it operates in a global way. And it is a true pleasure and a true honor to have Hitoshi Abe back to Sayar. So please join me to welcome Hitoshi. Well, 
somebody need to help me to switch this to um, thank you, Heldan, and uh, it's always nice to be back to SIRC. And uh, also, I see many friends here. It makes me very nervous, actually, to talk. Also, thank, thank you, Helnan, for a very nice introduction. Once in a while, it's nice to hear something good about myself from friends. You know, I don't hear that much so often, so. Um, Today's title is Remix, meaning I'm going to use a whole bunch of old projects and new projects mixed up and then wants to create the new story out of it. And uh, I think then the theme of the story is somehow related to Sayark. As actually Helnan, actually you got the, my graduation year correct, 89. I came to Sayark 1987, when actually the Ray Cappy stepped down and Michael took over the directorship. And uh, my first teacher was Tom. And then I studied after that uh, under uh, Wolf. And it was a postgraduate program, so I graduated after one year, and then I started to work for Kopemo Blau. Um, this is a picture from my uh, thesis review. So you see the young me with a glass on the right-hand side with a whole bunch of weird objects. That time, Sayuk was very exciting place, uh, like now, and uh, you know, we were very much excited about this new sort of phenomena about the deconstructivist movement. And also when I was there, actually I saw the huge section, one-to-one uh, -one scale model of space shuttle that somebody was working to design the interior. So all of this made me so exciting, but at the same time, you know, that I was like a Japanese who cannot speak English that well. so. You know, sometimes I had a difficulty to communicate with the professors. My English is a little bit better, but you know, please excuse me if I cannot really speak well today. But um, thesis was actually uh, happened around the three experiments that I did. Um, very strange experiments that I did myself because I was very much interested in relationship between myself or my body and the space and how I can actually initiate my own design without relying on anything from history or anything. How can we be, you know, how can I be more original? How I can find a way to respond to the condition I'm in in relationship with my own body. So, um, it's a it's a kind of weird oh, 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 weird sort of a thing that I did. So there's a three experimentation I did to myself uh, at the beginning of the thesis, and then based on that I did sort of a project. You see this large model that in in the middle of this picture. So today I'd like to try to do this kind of a thesis presentation of myself by using the, these three experimentation I did as key concept and then analyzed or kind of talk about my projects that I did after the graduation in this context. Again, um, these three experiments that I did is somehow happened around creating some sort of a boundary between myself and outside so that I was particularly uh, interested in this boundary surface. And I actually talk about this a lot in many lectures. And uh, to me, the boundary surface is where an event stands. To define the boundary is to define what is in contact with each other. And how can we actually use this idea to uh, basically push the design? So based on my thesis, 89, 
I kind of analyzed and then set up this three sort of a, a idea to deal with a boundary. The first one, which is very much uh, important in my d design process, is that uh, to me, the space is an accumulation of the surfaces. So the, there are many ways to define the three-dimensional spaces, but uh, to me, probably it is more likely the accumulation of the uh, stacked plane, like this line. And then as, as you move through this kind of a, a, a flat plane, uh, you start to experience the space. So this is uh, kind of a, a, a experiment that I did uh, called the cocoon experiment 89, which is I just put myself in this cheaply built balloon structure placed in front of the SIARC. And I was sitting there for maybe a day and see what's going to happen. I mean, without any idea what's going to happen. Nothing happened, actually, but uh, <laughs> except one moment that this is my friend Frank Stepper pushed the balloon, and then I immediately started to feel the connection with him, but also some sort of a, 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 a pressure. You know, I don't know what it was. Maybe it was just you know my weird uh, kind of hallucination after being in the, the balloon for such a long time. But I started to feel like uh, maybe that's the space, so that uh, my space at least the way to feel the space is to push my body through this plane, and then that becomes a kind of interesting relationship. It, that create, creates an interesting relationship with this plane and the, the body, and it could become interesting way to create the space by accumulating such kind of a, a layers. And this is maybe coming from my origin, being Japanese. You know, as you know, that the Japanese spaces are created by layers of plane. And uh, also, the architect that I really admire in Japan, Arata Isozaki, also said something in Japan. However, the space is thought to be a planar to dimensional compound. Depth is created by the composition of the planes. Uh, it's kind of interesting that the way that the Japanese architecture is conceived is, as you can see in this picture, it's a series of playing overlaid to each other. And then there are many kind of situations you can see such things, uh, like a ukiyo-e. And ukiyo-e is, of course, also creating this depth, not relying on the perspective, but creating the layer of different planes. So I thought that this could be one way to explain my work. And uh, this is a very much first project I did called Shirasagi Bridge. The idea was that there was an existing bridge and then the mayor wanted to turn it into something symbolic. So I basically proposed to create a gigantic handrail to wrap the whole bridge. But how to design such kind of a uh, shape was a big issue, and the uh, idea was let's kind of see this uh, ex you know, experience of walking through a bridge from one end to the other as a, also a series of experience of kind of a, how to say that, the, uh, passing so many planes accumulated along the uh, main axis of the bridge. So I designed this um, plane a series of triangular sort of a, a, a structure. And as you walk through, you will feel it's more like a being in a, a film, I guess, so that the series of uh, images will be actually continuously shown to you. And then it creates a space and a, your experience. And this is a diagram, and I've shown this so much, but this creates very much the main method of my uh, architectural design. 
same method was applied to a little bit more complex building, 2002 Reihoku Community Hall. This is a kind of a, a small auditorium for small community and also the community center. The whole thing was, you can see, you know, if you look at the, just the only one side, very similar gesture as uh, Shirasagi Bridge you just saw. So uh, the whole, whole sort of a, a plane was uh, accumulated along this one main central axis and uh, gradually keeps its, its shape and uh, creates sort of a continuous experience to your body. So this is a plan and according, and this is a framework and this is a kind of geometry that uh, actually uh, creating this building. So basically there's a, how to say that the point uh, along the roof of the building and there's a line swinging you know, to the right and left to basically create the spaces and creates like a pleats, like a, a, a gesture and then generating this sort of a form of the building. And because this was funded by uh, for Ministry of Forestry, we had to use the wood. And as you can see, the wood is used everywhere. And this is what it is. And uh, you can see, again, the similar sensation that as you walk through the plane gradually changes its shape you start to see the form and the uh, space is emer emerging. The auditoriums and then uh, some sort of a common area. We had to use local comp carpenter technique. So there are lots of interesting sort of uh, limitations and uh, uh, sort of a uh, uh, technique that we have, or the rules that we have to follow that defines how much you can tilt the members and that influences also the way that, that this shape was uh, uh, designed. So in a way, the internal and external sort of forces is balanced between this uh, 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 to form this uh, uh, shape. So this thing happened uh, in this building I did for Vienna. And uh, again, same, very linear gesture. And then uh, the shape kind of swings as you move. And in this case, not only just one gesture, but there's a multiple sort of a thin sort of a, a ribbon kind of a doing this kind of a snakeish kind of a movement and a creating space. Mine is a little one to the right bottom. And again, there's a lots of sort of a story that how you actually determine the way that the, this each ribbon swings. And then this is how it became. And then this is what it is. So you can see also this gesture, very similar, more simplified probably in this building. Then of course, you know, the just a linear or straight line, sort of a, a way that the body moves uh, can be applied to make more like a circular gesture. So for the stadium, we use this more circular geometry to create the accumulation of the plane and uh, created this Miyagi Stadium. And more recent one, we use a similar geometry for this uh, Mizuta Memorial Hall. That's a kind of a memorial, for, memorial hall for the founder of uh, university. And uh, 
again, you can see the same gesture. So that the one end, which is very much sort of a simple, and then gradually uh, change its form, transform its form to this end. And uh, the whole, whole sort of building is wrapping this existing hill, which is a symbol of the, uh, um, uh, this university. And uh, you enter from here, and then all this kind of a gesture is creating internal design so that uh, you can kind of uh, see the transformation of the form and shape while you're inside. And then you can see, as you enter, you see this uh, symbolic forest in the middle. The funny thing is, um, this is more recent, but um, I'm not sure if I'm actually advancing or not, but I'm kind of uh, following the same method and trying to actually see where I can get there. The one of the problem also I see is that, the, you know, even though I actually try to sort of design the space as I walk, as my body move, right? So it's a linear or circular, but then I started to feel like, but this boundary could be more three-dimensional. Like the balloon I was in can be not just laid up like this, but could be laid up like this, like just like this uh, soap bubble inside of the acrylic box. So I tried to do this for this small uh, museum. I was asked to do It's very small. It's only 200 square meter in a local uh, community. Uh, you know, of the uh, countryside of Japan. And uh, the idea is again, maybe there's uh, eight rooms and we squeeze it into this bubble and then creates this kind of a strange sculptural form. And uh, I, I, I think the one of the interesting sort of a characteristic to me is I'd like to be more honest about the nature of the geometry and the building, how to say the gesture of the building. And for this uh, particular uh, building and the structure, uh, we thought this building needs to be more like um, actual soap bubble. So instead of having columns and beams, we actually applied this kind of uh, embossed steel panel so that way that each rooms are surrounded by uh, thin pa steel panel and then connected to each rooms by the, this embossed, like, like a, a dot spot welded to each other. So this is unfolded drawing. So this is a basic section of the wall so you can see that the, the embossed pattern and then how each sort of a, a, a embossed will be connected. It's always interesting to work with somebody outside of the architectural industry because they want to, they like to see the architecture in a different way. And uh, they come up with sometimes very innovative solution that the architectural contractor cannot do. These are the shipbuilders, and then they came up with an idea so they can actually stamp the steel and create this embossed pattern, and then spoke welded it. And uh, they didn't mind to do this. So if you imagine asking the architectural contractor to do this and how much you will be charged for, and this, and then everything was kind of Composed together, welded together, and this is how it is. Uh, everything is steel, so in a way, very much strong and resilient against the earthquake. And uh, actually, this was done almost 15 or 16 years ago, and I visited this site last week, and this is how it is now. And I have to say that the cotton steel, it, I mean, first of all, it's 
architects joy to see the building you designed well maintained and well used and also you know i was kind of shocked by looking at this cold and steel and how it turned out i think it's i mean i didn't do this in a way i but it's much better than i thought so uh, in a way that I, the way I designed the space is kind of a one idea. And it's always about the accumulation of the plane and how you design the way that the, each plane transform in relationship to each other. That's it. But uh, as you work, you also start to see that the, 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 this boundary doesn't necessarily lead you to the space next to it physically. Sometimes the surface became some sort of portal connected to somewhere in distance or somewhere that doesn't exist. So um, <laughs> this is a second experiment I did, again, for my thesis here. And uh, again, this is me wearing this big black mask. And the idea was actually, I put myself in this white sphere where the daylight comes in, then it, basically you will see yourself being in this uh, neutral white space. You don't see the distance, you don't see, you see maybe the difference in the light. And then I walked uh, with this black head on the, uh, Venice Beach on Saturday afternoon. And it was kind of interesting because you are completely displaced from the context and then being in a very neutral space. But then outside, there are many things happening. And then sometimes, actually, there are many nasty sort of audience and then trying to push me to the, against the wall. Or I saw sometimes the ash of the cigarette coming down from the... But, you know, that's the kind of experiment. I remember actually the Dean, uh, I mean, Dan, who is here today, friend, took the, you know, supposed to take a video, me showing up from the ocean and then, you know, walking around the Venice Beach. But then after that, he said, sorry, I didn't take your video. I said, really? Why? And then he said, the, Oh, because, you know, I felt you are so dangerous and people trying to attack you, so I was busy trying to protect you. So thank you, Dan, for protecting me. <laughs> so that's why I have only picture like this. But maybe, you know, nowadays, maybe I used a different device to do the same effect. But that time, you know, there's no VR or nothing. But, you know, Many kind of situation like this is happening now around us, and uh, especially after COVID. So many things happens in this way, and uh, uh, this is a, one of the projects that I did. Basically, the idea is, you know, this is a little house being built in a very dense area of Tokyo, and just simple idea is to bring in the color of the sky into the house. So, you know, tilted ceiling, polished, nothing, all the lighting and other features are, fixtures are uh, along the wall. And then you see this effect. So you can import the sky that, uh, in, you know, above your head by doing this process. But similarly, um, this is a restaurant that I did and uh, it's inside of the building, and uh, uh, the client wanted to have some feeling about this kind of a, 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 a rows of trees inside of his restaurant. So I took the picture, I converted it into the series of dot, and then I created this drawing. Then, you know, I basically made a hole to this thin metal and then wrap the whole space and insert it into the restaurant. Same guys uh, from ship company, the whole trick won't work if you have a frame behind of this steel panel. So 
So it had to be monocoque. And uh, these guys are the ones that, who used to do uh, you know, this kind of technique uh, for their own ship. So only two millimeter thickness of the thin steel. Uh, and uh, we use the automatic type machine to put the pattern. And as you can see, outside, you can see the thinness of the steel, but if you look inside, all of a sudden you'll see much more depth and illusion of the forest. But it was very tough to just imagine, you have to bring in the steel inside of the existing building, weld it together. It's almost like a building submarine inside of the building, but these guys did a good job, except they refused to make a hole for the seam because if you weld the two metals, then the seam will have this much of the band without hole. So in order to let them do it, all my staff, including myself, went in one night, marked every hole with a fountain pen, so that way there's no way for these contractors to refuse to hand drill all these missing holes. So this is actually hand drilled along the silver line. But this is how it's been done. And uh, uh, as we intended, there's no sort of frame shown. Again, the idea is again, surface becomes some sort of a portal to bring in something. Same idea, this is more recent, but as a project, it's rather boring. It's a warehouse we are asked only to design exterior and landscape. And then we thought it's a maybe the interesting opportunity to try this and try the same idea. Um, so the, these dotted sort of uh, 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 images are the picture taken from the picture surrounding this site in a larger scale. And because this is inside of the industrial area, we thought that it would be nice to invert the whole sort of landscape of the city and then put it in, put it on the surface of this uh, warehouse. And this warehouse is crowded with a very thin sort of a, a cement panel. And uh, also there's some sort of a limitation about how many colors and which color we can use, but somehow we figure out and we create this kind of a weird sort of a camouflage of the building. So I don't know if it's successful or not, but if you actually look at the actual sort of a, how to say, the, uh, the overlay of the computer image onto the picture, maybe there's some moment that building might disappear. But uh, since it's not built yet, you know, it's hard to tell. Terasaki Research Institute, this is one and only building we built in LA at this moment and had a also a very similar idea of the surface as a portal. This is an existing building and then we renovated it. And uh, basically there's a, a courtyard in the middle, interior courtyard in the middle as a multi-purpose space sandwich by a series of offices. And then in the middle, uh, we have this oculus and uh, a hole that connects inside to outside. And, uh, you know, there's no window to outside. So, you know, this is the only way to see outside. And then the idea we had was uh, this oculus with this reflector, you will see actually the sky and uh, uh, also the landscape of the westward. So it's a kind of device to connect westward and also this building. So this is something, the section and showing the structure. Basically, it's like a structure is like a bicycle uh, wheel. So that, uh, oh yeah, this is, so it kind of spans quite good distance and then the whole roof was covered with a membrane and in the middle we have this accurate that 
consist with oh this is actually the the installation we did for sire at this gallery and uh, people are laying actually to see the effect of the oculus so in a way this is the actual one that we installed and you see the middle there's oculus and we wanted to use uh, stainless steel to do it as a one sort of a monolithic uh, 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 scope, but uh, you know, obviously we are not Aniska Pool who has an unlimited budget, so we had to use the fiberglass casted and then chromonized. So this is so that means it has to be sort of a, a smaller so that it will fit into the oven to be baked. So that's why the every this Oculus was broken into several pieces. And uh, this is a piece, which isn't too bad. And then this is a, a skylight and outside. So the images comes in from here, reflected by this Oculus, and then you can kind of observe it if you pay attention to it. Similar idea of the Oculus was tried also in this exhibition that I did in uh, Tokyo and Los Angeles. This is an exhibition about the disaster and to introduce seven different idea of the cities, uh, you know, who is resilient against different sort of type of disaster. So the idea of the exhibition is that the hanging sort of a screen will show the image of the disaster around the world and seven wells uh, on the right hand side will show the different ideas of the city. And uh, the well we design here is a balloon structure which has a screen at the bottom. So if you look inside then you start to hear the uh, sound and explanation of the projects and then uh, also you can enjoy the videos like this. And then as you stand up then you will hear the more ambient of the disaster and uh, very similar idea about uh, you know, the accuracy and the connection. And I do also enjoy to see how people's body started to interact with the object and the sort of a design of the object allowing them to do this kind of a uh, gesture. More serious sort of a building, this was a headquarter for 3M, and we also tried to design this kind of portal, but portal as more like a part of the uh, uh, creative working space. And in this case, the portal consists with this uh, digital uh, sort of a work surface with a giant big screen to basically share the information among the workers. And uh, these uh, sort of portal uh, communication hub was placed along the corridor of this complex connecting different buildings. So as you walk through, you will see this kind of portal and then you, know, you can just stop by and then work together with the calling happen to be there or also get some information uh, broadcasted uh, from the other offices and so on. So the idea is again, to kind of encourage people to communicate more and then enhance the creative environment. And then, of course, we have to do the interior along it so that there's a many small lounges, cafeteria, lecture hall, and uh, it's surrounded by this kind of a uh, newly designed uh, courtyard that we designed as also place for uh, this uh, company's community. And uh, again, you know, that each hubs are identified by the color and it consists with uh, small breakout rooms and then uh, again the collaborative sort of counter 
it's a little bit more like a, a, you know the Star Trek ish kind of design, but uh, then uh, there's a digital again a device that uh, being created. This is the first time for us to actually work together with digital designer and then trying to come up with idea to bridges the digital world and the real world and how can we actually create such kind of a relationship uh, or to create such a relationship between virtual and the real. I'm not sure this is more classic way, classic approach to do this. But then the, in the next project, which is more uh, experimental, we try to hybridize the virtual and real um, more, much sort of a, in an innovative way. Cloud of Thought was done for the Okamura's. Uh, Okamura is a Japanese sort of a office furniture company, and they provided us the gallery space to try our um, uh, idea. And the uh, idea is again how we can create a three dimensional space meeting room that people can actually accumulate the knowledge and exchange the knowledge. So idea was actually to prepare the space where physically person can get in. And then there's a image of the people who was there before. And then there's a, also some sort of a, a, a alias represented by series of ideas like this dotted image. And then also, of course, there's a shadow of people. So in a way, there's many people inside leaving their ideas, and then you can communicate to each other even though you are not here. I'm not sure if it was very successful, but uh, we kind of did it. And uh, this is really strange, but this is a text, yeah, if it's not moving, but supposed to be the human figure, uh, representing some idea, and uh, you see there's a name like J.C. Reiser, architect, Princeton University, Yubench Ozell, artist, and professor UCLA. So there are many people that are showing up with this kind of a weird sort of a icon, and then at some point you can read the idea that they are representing. I mean, it was a beautiful space, but uh, I'm not sure it was successful as a 3D blog space. Along this line, you know, the, this is a, probably the newest one from our office. It, it's called the Cape. This is many, like many of architects at SIARC, we were part of this uh, competition for the digital signage uh, for this uh, uh, Sunset Bluebird. And the city of West Hollywood is actually encouraging uh, you know, the, the, the company who is doing this billboard to regain artistic value of uh, landscape along the Sunset Bluebird by uh, sort of encouraging a creation of the artistic sort of billboard and we were asked to be part of it. Existing building is like that. The condition we are giving is we have to uh, build the digital signage and then uh, also a static sign signage or billboard and not to touch to the building. And what shall we do? So this is what we did. And uh, the idea came from basically the capes. And uh, if you look at the many sort of uh, uh, art, you know, art in the history, always this kind of a uh, cape or the wing or something is used to create the, some sort of, a, to add the divineness to the human body. The easiest sort of example is these two drawing. Superman without cape looks like a strange man with a blue suit. You need a cape to gain the divineness. So the idea is again, we cannot touch the building, so let's make a cape 
for the building. So this structure, uh, you know, the sort of trying to be the key blowing by the wind is actually the idea to bridge static sign and a digital sign. It, and there are some sort of forces in between and it becomes a gigantic sculpture. And it's kind of, I don't know if you can see, it's supported by one big column with a secondary column. So there's only two columns and it's cantilevers 20 meter, I think. But it's again, it's just a kind of a sculpture and it consists, and you see this big beam behind. And uh, they are collaborating with the LGBT Center and then the idea is also to honor the local heroes by uh, using these screens and the owner will gain this cape. They also, there's uh, two layers of metal panel and it creates this kind of effect. And we are still working on the detail, but uh, we are pretty much excited about this project at this moment. The last one is this uh, old one, a little bit. It's a surface of participation. And uh, this is a, also the third experiment I did. It's a card box. I put the card box on the roof of Old Sire in Santa Monica. And I was there for a day. And again, in this case, nothing happened, really nothing happened. I almost slept inside. But the funny thing is when I jumped up because I couldn't really bear not to go to the restroom, then I realized that there's a whole bunch of my friends and students who are watching. So in a way, the inside, nothing happened, but more very boring, but outside, it was successful enough to bring in some sort of activity and then attract many people to come up to see. I still remember my friend came to me and said, could you actually meditate? What did you get by this experience? And I had to say, let me go to the bathroom first. However, this kind of a, a, a experience and you know, even when I was in Japan, I was so uh, attracted to do this kind of an event by using ex existing sort of a infrastructure. So in a town, I actually used uh, just a city mall to do the wedding or some sort of a weird racing event for kids or turning the uh, uh, distribution district into the, some sort of a uh, temporary party place for the mu music events. And I was attracted to basically uh, organize the event to change the meaning of the place to kind of create the con different, con to change the context of the place to trigger uh, changes. So when I moved to LA also, I couldn't help. And then as I start to know the Little Tokyo, I proposed this Little Tokyo Design Week 2011, and then we turned the whole uh, little Tokyo into the sort of a, a event space to celebrate the design from Japan. And uh, many of you, actually who is here, participated. We placed a container, 20 something containers along the street as a small uh, museum. And also we collaborated three museums and then a commercial district. This is an exhibition inside of the uh, containers. This is a giant robot from West LA. Sylvia did the exhibition on the Expo Japan. And there's a many also symposia happened. And there's a Pecha Kucha and, and a, you know, 50 designer from town presented their work and there's a party. It's kind of interesting that by doing this kind of event, you can alter the meaning of the uh, existing context and you can actually see that things that usually don't happen happens. And I, I'm not sure this is some kind of work that I should show, but I see this is a very important activity uh, for myself 
also, and then somehow related to my actual creative work. Ideas, uh, also you, you know, is also the sort of a somehow related to this kind of a action. And again, it was joy as a chair to be involved to start this ideas campus, working, bringing a robot from Toyota, working with my old professor, and as well as friends, and to, to do this kind of a new platform. And uh, Arcade, similarly, this is uh, actually the, uh, when the 2011, when the uh, uh, big earthquake uh, destroyed my hometown and the uh, area that I know very well. So I started this uh, uh, collaboration with 200 architects in Japan, and it's a relief and recovery by architects for the Tohoku earthquake and tsunami. And uh, we try to basically uh, recover or the educa architecture education in the area and also try to help the community to recover and then also try to accumulate the knowledge that we learn from there. There are many things happen. Lots of, lots of uh, communication, lots of architects involved and lots of actually uh, solution was provided. And then we, after the five years, we put all this knowledge into the big book. So uh, I'm so much attracted by this kind of activities and uh, you know, the, the sort of a action to change the con existing context, action to change the way the community works. And then also, you know, the, I'm just thinking like how I can combine such idea into the architecture so that we did this kind of a, also the uh, architecture that can actually let the people design, participate, and then you know, connect the people's activity and the building itself. This is a, a little house we did for Make It Right Foundation. Uh, you know, uh, for New Orleans, uh, initiated by Brad Pitt. So we were asked to provide uh, some sort of design uh, for the people who lost houses by Hurricane Katrina. In this one, we just presented one plan, but you can cut out, you know, the, the doors as you want. And then uh, by doing it, you can have like a, almost multiple like incredible number of different kind of plan that suits you. So the idea of how we can actually combine this idea of triggering new activities and so on, but then how we can actually also design the platform to house that, or uh, how we can design the uh, more, uh, how to say, interconnected relationship between the place and the uh, action was a big issue for me. And uh, this is a building we did 20 years ago for Sony headquarters. We won the competition. I, I remember I was competing against George Yu, who passed, and uh, um, we were selected as a winning entry. But the idea we presented was more like a strategy, so that the, we just said the building is not the building, it consists with mega floor, which is more like an infrastructure, and then the wear is some devices slash interior uh, feature, and the provider is more like, a, let's say, WeWork. And then the provider makes the environment more fluid and more responsive, and the wear, actually this was designed by Bruce Mao, and, uh, is a series of technology supported tool to make the, uh, you know, the workspace more efficient or more interesting or creative. The one of the big, and these are the some imagery, and then the mega floor as a platform. Um, again, the big question was if the 20 years ago, okay, 
there's a technology advance, so there's no need to come to the office. Everybody can work anywhere you want because of the ubiquitous system available, then what's the role of uh, headquarter? How we should design it? So our solution was uh, actually we should make this whole thing consist with mega floor, which is an uh, infrastructure, where, which is more like a flexible, first changing sort of a, a, a environment and a provider who controls the whole thing. And then, but the floor itself, what's the new standard? And uh, uh, so this is a, like a office building now, but then the main floor, more flatter, much taller, not the central core, and much more stout, and the public space should surround it. These are like a, how wide the floor is and then how tall the each floor should be to accommodate different needs. By changing the dimension, that changes the way that the, uh, how say the phenomena happens in the building in different way. It changes uh, the, all the physicality of the building and then the physical phenomena happening and the different sort of uh, access and then how the building will be accessed from multiple direction, different mobility can be accessible, stoutness, surrounded, blah, blah, blah. I, you know, the design-wise, it's not so exciting, maybe, but uh, I, we were so excited about idea of shifting sort of a standard of the environment and then to accommodate uh, the new technology and, and trigger the new way of living. That might actually be the great platform for new activities. And we thought that the, that's a very important role for architect. And uh, as we actually, uh, now 20 years past, and uh, there are many things happening, changes happening, especially the world of mobility. And we are involved in this mobility company who is pushing mobility to uh, change that building. Like, you know, the, the mobility has to come into the building and then has to, they have a little robot inside and spreads all over the building, but then how building should be. Or, um, you know, or, or the road, definition of the road. You know, in this one, every element of the road is movable. And if the autonomous vehicle is coming, the meaning of the road will be different. It's not just only for the transportation, but it could be something else. So all this kind of a shift of the framework and then getting out of the frame that actually uh, we are so used to is very important. Of course, you know, I like to design beautiful buildings, which is super important. But at the same time, that capability can be used to be inventive, to change the norm and to change the shift, uh, to make the big shift into the society can be used. So I cannot show much, but uh, what is next step is obviously to expand such kind of, a, 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 how to say, the exploration of looking for new norm and shifting standard to the new standard to the scale of the city, scale of our day-to-day -day life. And uh, I think it's coming. I mean, 20 years ago, the Sony project failed because at the end, the client all of a sudden started to say, we want to have a normal building. So they basically squeeze the floor from five meter to two three meter, and then that was the end of it. So I had to resign. But now maybe the timing is coming and uh, we can actually contribute to that. And uh, I'm not sure, you know, if I succeeded, you know, to explain my thesis well. I'm not sure if people in front of me can give me a plus or B, 
However, uh, is it true that somehow this is where I started? And I see still lots of potential and uh, potential of architecture and potential of, I don't know, thinking about architecture and changing. The, uh, there's a possibility of making the world a little better. Sorry to say this, maybe. But it's a, it's a wonderful sort of a profession we are in, and I do thank you to Sayak for giving me that opportunity. Thank you very much.